Hello, and welcome again to the Surgical Clinics podcast. Surgical Clinics is a bi-monthly publication consisting of review articles devoted to a central topic important to general surgeons. Surgical Clinics has published for over 100 years, and the series and the podcast can be found at www.surgical.theclinics.com. I'm John Vassallo, the managing editor of the series here at Elsevier, and for our fourth podcast, we'll be discussing four articles in the December 2022 issue on management of benign breast disease. Here to discuss lactation disorders, dermatology, juvenile breast disease, and male breast disease will be our consulting editor of surgical clinics, Dr. Ron Martin, senior surgeon from the Department of General Surgery at Pullman Regional Hospital and Clinic Network in Pullman, Washington. Joining him will be the guest editor of the benign breast disease issue, Dr. Melissa Captanian, surgeon and director of the Logan Health Breast Center in Kalispell, Montana. Welcome to both of you and over to you, Dr. Martin. John, thank you very much for the introduction. Melissa, it's great to see you again and to hear from you again. As many members of the podcast probably won't know, Melissa and I used to have the option to work with each other when I was in Montana with her and she's an outstanding breast surgeon and really has been super helpful and helping us address an issue that I think doesn't get as much attention as it ought to. Particularly in my time working in training scenarios, I find that a lot of people focus on malignant diseases of the breast, but not nearly as many on the benign diseases, which actually are the majority of them, certainly represent a ton of concern. So, Melissa, it's great to have you on the podcast with us. And thanks again to you and your colleagues for all the hard work you did on this issue. Um, We have the four topics, as, as John outlined that we're going to go over today, but I thought we'd start out with the section in the benign breast issue on dermatologic conditions. Uh, As one of my former partners used to say, deep down inside, we're all superficial. And so things start at the surface and maybe we'll start there and work our way in. So one of the things I was struck reading through this that I find consistent among many dermatologists is they have a long laundry list of splitting things out into subtle distinctions. So, you know, when you look at the series of charts in this particular article, it's it's incredibly helpful if you have them in front of them and almost impossible to memorize if you're not a dermatologist. Tell us a little bit, if you wouldn't mind, somebody comes into you with a skin level problem of their breast and somebody has seen them and hasn't really tried hard to figure it out. And it's over to you. Where, Where do you start and how do you recommend approaching the person who comes in with some concern regarding breast skin. Well, thanks for starting there. And I'd be remiss if I didn't thank Dr. Throckmorton and her colleagues for contributing on this. I saw a presentation that she gave at a conference once and uh, she was one of the all-stars in my fellowship class. And I said, wow, yeah, that's, we all knew this woman was the smartest one amongst us um, and it's continued to be true. What I think the most important thing um, that she points out when the patient comes in, they all think they have cancer. They all think they have either Paget's disease or inflammatory breast cancer. I find that to be almost universally true. No one comes to me with a diagnosis of rash on breast skin, figure this out, please. They come with a diagnosis of rule out inflammatory breast cancer. So I must say that managing that fear and uncertainty in the patient is your first order of business. Then quite honestly, the tables included in this chapter are excellent, breaking things down into neoplasms, which is not necessarily cancer. There are many other benign neoplasms infections and their mimickers, as well as inflammatory diseases. I think that this all gets down to what I hope we're still teaching in medical school is to start with a good history and physical. For most dermatologic conditions, there is something associated. There's a new exposure. There's a new medication. There's an associated syndrome or disease that the patient has. And so skipping a good history um, would be extra peril uh, for dermatologic conditions of the breast. And then physical exam, including other parts of the body. I feel very differently about a dermatologic condition on the breast that also manifests on the back or the extremities, as opposed to one that manifests on the breast alone. Uh, Dr. Throckmorton and her colleagues really do get into a lot of, you are correct, uh, minutia, but minutia that's important about the appearance, other locations, and risk factors for these diseases. So that's where I would say um, was to start with the dermatologic conditions of the breast. Yeah, and to maybe a bit correct myself, I don't mean minutia in the sense of trivial, I mean minutia in the sense of great detail. And I don't think any of it minutial in consequence. And, and to be honest with you, I am a little concerned that we're not actually teaching history 
and physical as well as we could with our younger colleagues. I'd say at least in my general job, probably 90% of what I do is help people take a history and physical. There's a lot of people that are replacing technology for thinking and they order more tests and more imaging and less on trying to solve things out. I don't think we've taken it out of the curriculum. I just somehow think it hasn't maintained the level of importance in the training world. I think once you get into being a staff person for a while and you actually have to deliver product, you have to go back and relearn that. If anybody is listening to us out of, you know, my old world of medical undergraduate medical education and graduate medical education, pretty pleased with sugar on top, go back to reinforcing histories and physicals, particularly history. The patient will almost always tell you what's wrong with them if you just listen, and they'll usually give you the answer. But And I think having a chart like that, that allows you to focus your questioning. I mean, even if you're not sure, like if somebody's not an expert at breast disease as you are, if somebody has somebody come in and they pull up those charts, there's a lot of, do they have this? Do they have this? Yes, no. Usually, not usually. You could really go down that laundry list of questions and probably come pretty close to the diagnosis in a short period of time in most folks. Absolutely. And why I picked four chapters that I wanted to discuss is because I feel that these, more than anything else in this issue, are all topics upon which the surgeon needs to collaborate with another colleague. A lot of times, I'm not going to be the one prescribing a TNF alpha inhibitor or any of these high level things. I'm going to be conversing intelligently with my dermatology colleague. I'm going to make the patient feel that I understand what's going on with them and I'm collaborating with a colleague, not saying, I don't know, you need to go see this other guy. These charts have been incredibly helpful as Dr. Throckmorton's other work for me, just going through that list and saying, what are the characteristics? What is a dermatologist going to want to know? And I've been you know, very rewarded in that, being able to hand off quite a few patients to a dermatologist with a working diagnosis, not with a, I think it's their skin, I'm not quite sure. It's a better collaborative relationship, and I think that that's what um, this gets into. Also, I think that it's important to not treat things wrong. I don't know about you, what I was taught about dermatology in medical school was that if it was wet, make it dry. If it was dry, make it wet. If you gave it steroids and that didn't work, try antifungals. And I think that that is, that's definitely false. For the infections and their mimickers, the candida, tinea corporis, tinea versicolor, all of these fungal infections, I'm always surprised by how differently they're treated. It isn't just enough to say, try an antifungal. Really dialing down into which fungal condition and what the first line should be uh, is the difference between you know, making a diagnosis and treating it or not. And the other you know, item in this chapter that I would really like to point out uh, to our other surgical colleagues is treatment of hydradenitis. Uh, I think that that is, amongst all of these dermatologic conditions, the one that is treated wrong most often. Most people know to give antibiotics, brain abscesses, and past that, I think everyone skips to large excisions, including skin grafts. That can be incredibly undertreating folks with a chronic disease that makes their life pretty bad or over-treating people with more surgery than they need. I think Dr. Throckmorton and colleagues point out on um, table five on page 1053, some really good options for hydradenitis and a far more nuanced treatment to this disease than I think most of us were taught in general surgery residency. So I'd like to thank them for really spending time on that disease, which I do think comes to surgeons' offices more than maybe some of these other things, just because it is treated surgically many times. Well, that leads me to sort of the next question and, and sort of preface it a little bit with, it strikes me that depending where one is in this country, your relative access to dermatologic colleagues or not, and your relative access to people with significant expertise in breast disease or not. There's a tremendously variable set of resources, but the patients who come into wherever are pretty evenly distributed over the entire breadth of society. So I guess the thing is, is, when do you think it's okay for surgeons to sort of pursue the course of some of these things? And which ones do you think should definitely be referred to breast specialist and or dermatologist? I highly believe in team-based care. I think that wherever you are, being able to pick up the phone and call a dermatologist, call a more senior surgeon, call one of your internal medicine 
and colleagues that's old enough to still carry around a black bag and probably know with a stethoscope and probably knows how to do a physical exam. I think that the basis of this article that I like particularly is it describes these illnesses very well so we can all have a conversation and work on the patient together. I don't think any of this requires a breast specialist. I should say that everything requires a breast specialist, that this requires a good diagnostician that's willing to listen to the patient and also be patient. Patience is not something found in surgeons terribly often. I'm as guilty as any of the rest of us. I would like to see a problem and treat it with a sharp object and have it be gone. And a lot of these conditions do require a lot more patience. You need to be willing to try the first course, the second course, stay with the patient, reassure them over multiple courses of treatment that you're going down the right paths. And so this is very basic medicine. And I think every surgeon can, with some patients, wrap their head around these dermatologic conditions and collaborate with colleagues. So to answer your question, I think all of this is within the scope of the community general surgeon with enough attention to the patient and the issue which is why I very much appreciate how thoroughly this is laid out in this chapter. It is a very good guideline for how to do that. Yeah. I mean, I'd like to think the pandemic may have given us a foothold into it that hasn't really fully materialized yet. Of all the things I can think of where telemedicine, at least amongst colleagues, has a lot of room for help. This is at the, near the top of the list um, because you generally can photograph everything and send that along. And that plus having a common vocabulary, as you sort of alluded to from the things, ought to be able to really project power out to the periphery in terms of being able to get things taken care of. I will say that, you know, there's an old adage that says that good judgment comes from experience and experience comes from bad judgment. The same can sort of be said of patients. I mean, as you get older in the surgical game, which now I have to confess I'm doing, um, you learn that being patient's to your best advantage because being impatient usually leads you into problems you wish you'd waited on earlier. So if you haven't learned it when you're young, you'll you'll be forced to learn it over time, whether you want to or not. That's all great advice. And again, I agree. I, I'd really like to extend a thanks to Dr. Throckmorton and her colleagues. It's a spectacular chapter. One last thing on this before we move on to the next one. When somebody comes in, which disease states do you think you're obligated to sort of address or rule out before you engage in something that takes a longer course of evaluation? So obviously, uh, Paget's disease and inflammatory breast cancer need to be ruled out uh, off the top. But I also think that if the patient has any history of an autoimmune disease or any history of radiation, those really lead me down a different path. Um, radiation-induced morphia is an interesting thing. I've seen it. I've also seen a radiation-induced sarcoma. Those need to be ruled out. And in the patients with autoimmune diseases, they really can have very different presentations um, and also cutaneous malignancies. So in the patients with history of radiation or history of autoimmune disease, it definitely takes me to a biopsy sooner rather than later to rule out those secondary malignancies that we know those folks on immunosuppressives um, or who have had radiation can have. Those are more immediate. You don't want to miss those. Well, thanks. Moving on a little bit to juvenile breast disease. You know, there's there are places with a lot of pediatric support, including pediatric surgical support, and there are places with virtually none. So there's going to be a lot of overlap and distinction between the kind of environment uh, somebody's practicing in. But once again, reading through the chapter, it strikes me as to how understanding basic embryology and development is kind of critical to figuring out, well, really what's going on with anybody, I'd say, but particularly the young people. But in reading through this, one of the things that struck me, and maybe I just am not that observant, but they were talking about polymastia being a percent of the population. I'm struggling to think that one out of 100 people I've seen has polymastia. I think that number seems a little generous to me. I mean, I realize it's a small number, but did you see that that often? When you're a hammer, all the world's a nail. Um, all I do is breast surgery. Um, and yes, I do see a lot of polymastia and I see a lot of polymastia that's not diagnosed as such. Um, it is usually axillary. And so you have people that just assume they're chubby and they're not, it's accessory breast tissue. This can manifest with breastfeeding. Um, I've had patients that it's hard for them to put down their arms when they're breastfeeding. Also, I do think that it's very important to know that that rate is that high because that is unscreened breast tissue. That's often not captured um, on the two view screening mammogram, even with the medial lateral oblique view. 
And so if you can identify that somebody has accessory breast tissue in an abnormal location, you really do need to keep an eye on that. Um, those can develop all the problems that uh, centrally located breast tissue can. So I do think I see that much, but like I said, I'm a hammer, all the world's, world's a nail. You may be having a bit of a selective population. I am. <laughs> I, I think that the number certainly greater than zero and important to be aware of. And 1% and is not a high number. But when you multiply it by, give or take, 160 million women in the United States, um, and who knows what the incidence would be in men, perhaps it's the same. That's a lot of folks. You know, you expect to be walking around out there. And, and, and you know, if it is, I've either done a terrible job of examining people or haven't noticed it as much. One of the excellent points you make is if you're going to have a screening test for tissue that's at risk for something, one had better understand the totality of the tissue that needs to be screened. Um, and make sure that they get it. But I think one of the interesting things to me in reading through this chapter was looking at the normal tricks that one has to examine, evaluate, and intervene on fully developed breast tissue have to be reconsidered in developing breast tissue. So you want to walk us through how you approach developing breast tissue differently in terms of either exam or evaluation or, or management if something comes up? Absolutely. Dr. Norellius is the pediatric surgeon that I practice with. We're actually operating on a giant uh, juvenile fibroadenoma together uh, next week. Uh, so I am just uh, always happy to, to have her around to collaborate with. And she's taught me this. Children are not little grown-ups; They're children. And when you have a child uh, in your office, you have two patients. You have a child and you have their parent. So I would say that those are things that I don't encounter in my daily practice. So I'm generally an adult surgeon. And so she's always there to remind me of that, that they uh, really do have uh, distinct needs. So that's important. Also mammography, which is the bread and butter of the adult breast surgeon and general surgeon who deals with uh, breast diseases, not applicable in children. It's always ultrasound is the best modality. With the combination of ultrasound and physical exam, most of your diseases of the juvenile breast can be elucidated. Also, they definitely break down into very distinct categories for what stage of development the breast is in. These correlate roughly with age, but I think it's better to look at tanner stage. We do have a lot of precocious puberty going on, young women that are reaching puberty earlier than they have in generations past. And I can't tell you that there's an average 12-year-old. Some 12-year-olds are very well-developed, and some 12-year-olds are clearly still small children. And so using the Tanner stages and really having those in the front of your mind when evaluating a patient is important. Because most of the congenital disorders of the breast require the surgeon to do what surgeons are not always good at, which is sit on our hands. Congenital disorders of the breast are very often treated with reassurance of your second patient, mom and dad, um, and leaving them alone. Developmental disorders are the same thing. Those really have to be taken in context of where along the path of development that young lady or man is. And then it's the acquired disorders of the breast that come into the surgeon's office and do require our surgical attention. But you really have to know whether you're dealing with a congenital developmental or acquired disorder before you can decide if the surgeon plays a role past reassurance and monitoring. So some of the acquired disorders may fall into sort of the infection camp. And there's a wide range of ages of people now who are getting pierced or, or something else, or just developing other, other issues that come up. So when somebody's got breast infection, and they're, say, 13 years old and 10 or 3 heading to 4, maybe, how do you approach them differently or the same as you would adults with other such acquired issues? Thank you for asking this, because I do see infections in the adolescent group in my office with some regularity. Every single pediatrician that refers that child to me, it's the only one they've seen. And every single time mom thinks that something terrible is going on and it's the only one, her child's the only one it's ever happened to. So again, managing that fear is incredibly important. Saying, I've seen this before. This is not unusual. I know how to deal with this. In your neonatal population who can also acquire infections, you have to start with IV antibiotics in that group. Oral antibiotics in neonates just doesn't work terribly well. But in the adolescents, you really can treat them with oral antibiotics and aspiration. Now, that means that you have to either be comfortable with ultrasound-guided aspiration yourself in your office, 
or you need to really collaborate, the theme of my issue here, uh, with your radiology colleagues, because these are should not be handled like adult breast biopsies. Must have a chaperone in the room, must consider sedation, must really approach this child as a child. But I strongly believe that aspiration is first line as opposed to incision and drainage um, because it minimizes damage to the breast. As much as you can stay peripheral, not periareolar to disturb a breast bud, if you can stay peripheral, if you can manage with oral antibiotics and even repeat aspiration, many of these will resolve with conservative management. I mostly see these in young athletes. They're dancers or gymnasts or volleyball players. I don't know what it is about repetitive trauma um, to nipples from a lot of moving around and maybe a locker room environment. I generally treat these girls for staph aureus, but I have a low threshold to consider community required MRSA, um, as I've just seen a lot of that in this population. Well, that's, that's interesting. Um, I think as you bring up the idea of skin breach, either through activity or adornment or whatever, it comes up and it comes up from time to time. And I think uh, at least the different places I've worked, there is a different level of parental surprise at what their kids have been up to. And who knows? I mean, I may fall prey to the same thing. And I'm not trying to claim immunity from it. I mean, I think I know what my kids are doing on a routine basis. I could be totally out to lunch. I mean, who knows how it's going to work out. But I think that that's, you know, something to be looked at. And, you know, as you say, the biograms for communities now are widely diverse. So you got to know your local biograms and your local susceptibility patterns to drugs. And in a place like you live and in places like I've been, where there's big fluctuations in populations for people that come for tourism reasons or seasonal change, the biograms in one month of the year may be totally different than the biograms in another month, uh, depending on your, your standard populations. That's going to be factored in. Take, for example, you've, you've got this teed up case with your pediatric surgery colleagues. Tell me, that how, how do you change or alter your approach to operative management in the developing breast? You know, what, what sort of guidance would you give? Well, I mean, masses in the juvenile breast, about 95% of these are going to be fibroadenomas. I've seen people take the good advice to intervene less and then decide that they want an FNA instead of a core needle biopsy to diagnose that. I wouldn't bother. Um, an FNA is never going to diagnose a stromal lesion accurately. And so I would say that's an important step to skip. Don't FNA anything. But the surgical approach really is avoiding collateral damage. I differ a little bit with some people on this. Some people say that many lesions can be excised through a circumareolar incision. I actually like to avoid that, if at all possible, on developing breast. I feel like the breast bud is directly under the areola. Um, and also those circumareolar incisions, though cosmetically pleasing, oftentimes will uh, cause trouble with breastfeeding down the road. Not mostly infant latch, but latching on of a breast pump. The flange just goes right where you're going to put your circumareolar incision. And you may think you did something very cosmetically pleasing on a 12-year-old that she does not thank you for later because neither of you thought of it. Anything you can do to stay in the inframammary fold or stay in the periphery of the breast, honestly, I think is the best incision. It avoids collateral damage to the breast bud, which is mostly central. It's cosmetically appealing, um, and it should have the least risk of uh, disrupting breastfeeding. Now, that being said, sometimes the incision has to go where the mass is, um, and anything you can do to stay in Langer's lines and have a nice curved incision to go along uh, with the contour of the breast is definitely good. But avoiding collateral damage to the breast. If you don't want margins. And you don't want to do what a lot of us breast surgeons love to do, which are our little oncoplastic rearrangements. Leave it alone. Juvenile breast, just let it be the starfish that it is, regrow, and don't intervene too much. Well, that kind of leads us into the next section of our discussion about complications of lactation, which I think probably has tremendous overlap between our surgical colleagues, our breast surgeons, our pediatricians, and our OB gyne colleagues plus probably a few others. But I found that the, the way this chapter was written to be fascinating and helpful, and I think maybe we should do more of it in certain things. I found this to be an interesting collection of things. But when I was working in the military, both as active duty and then when I was a civilian professor in the military, one thing you see a lot on military bases, which are loaded with young people, is a lot of pregnant either soldiers or airmen or guardsmen, Marines, or their spouses. So 
there's an awful lot of obstetric and young person medicine practiced in that area, much more so than you'd run into in the civilian sector as a regular general surgeon. So you're forever getting people in with problems while they're lactating or about lactating. Since a lot of us who don't do what you do for a living see it a little less commonly, you want to walk us through how do you approach fluid collections, masses, or other concerns in the lactating patient? Which, what's your starting point? I must point out first, I was a little bit starstruck when Dr. Mitchell uh, actually accepted my invitation to write this chapter. Amongst the breast surgery world, she really is considered the preeminent expert um, in, on this topic. Um, and I learn something every time I listen to her speak. So I just wanted to point out, I really do think that this, this chapter is pretty much gospel for lactational disorders and the surgeon's role in them. I would say that just like the dermatologic conditions, why did the patient end up in your office? The patient ended up in your office because somebody wanted you to rule out that they had a cancer. Dr. Mitchell does not touch on that in her chapter, but I think that it is important for us to, in this format, again, managing that fear. Someone's got either a late, you know, is late in their pregnancy or has a little tiny infant at home and they find a lump in their breast. Don't tell me that's where her brain is, hasn't gone. Definitely the reassurance, if you can provide that, and that reassurance can come from history, physical exam, imaging. Imaging is very helpful to distinguish cystic from solid masses or fluid from solid masses. Um, and then biopsy if necessary. I find rightfully so that people shy away from intervening on a lactating breast because they're terrified of the dreaded milk fistula. And Milk fistulas can be a terrible complication. Dr. Mitchell takes us very well through milk fistulas and how they can be managed. They're rare if they're managed appropriately. I think that that makes everyone feel better. So definitely let your radiologist know. If it's a solid mass and they're concerned, biopsy it. Then it's our role to make sure that we minimize the risk of milk fistula. In the milk fistula section, she points out that uh, people should be instructed to breastfeed physiologically. Why do we think we know better than the human body? Um, let, just allow the woman to continue breastfeeding. Don't tell them to stop breastfeeding. Also, don't tell them to over breastfeed. There's a feedback inhibition method. If you over breastfeed, the breast will overproduce and you will increase the risk of milk fistula. So do a biopsy if it's necessary, continue to breastfeed, but don't over breastfeed or um, you know, overstimulate the breast. Also, you know, don't do too little, but don't do too much. So I would say that's important. You really need to rule out the malignancy and you really need to not shy away from the biopsy if possible, but you need to help your radiology colleagues and say, do what you need to do. I'm going to help you manage this patient. We're in this together and we can avoid the milk fistula complication. So let's follow that thought for a second, because some of the discussion in here is sort of, sort of retrograde drainage you know, sort of pulling things back away rather than trying to drain things prograde forward. So how do you help our IR friends, our radiology friends, sort out that it's not the shortest path to the collection that you want to drain or biopsy, but it's the most advantageous path? They like to do the very cosmetically appealing, put the biopsy incision along the areolar or margin. But for a breastfeeding individual, again, this can definitely inhibit the baby being able to latch uh, and even more flanges from breast pumps being very uncomfortable at that location. So trying to biopsy more distally, definitely, definitely advantageous. So I do like when these patients come to see me first, because then I can talk them and the radiologist through things and we can manage whatever's downstream together. So more distally located biopsy sites. One of my great failures, and I have several to choose from, but when I was in director of medical education, I was trying to get it so that our radiology residents would have to go to an operating room on some occasion. And I think I picked a number of like five times after they did a wire localization for breast biopsy, which is a little tiny bit off topic, but somewhat related, just to see that where they put the tip of the wire and how they got there may not be helpful or may be helpful to the person who has to then go and do the biopsy. And I couldn't get any traction on this. I could not get a program director to agree to have their resident actually follow one patient from imaging wire loc to the operating room to see how that pan through specimen analysis and to go home, which I, I total failure. I mean, I got zero, none, none whatsoever. 
But I do think that if you want good information from our radiology friends who generally don't meet the patient the same way we do, then one can't complain if they don't share information with our radiology friends about what's our concern, what are we looking for, and how do we need to approach it. So there's a give and take in the surgical world. So for those who always complain that the radiologists don't do things right, I guess my first question is, did you go and talk to them? I mean, literally go and talk to them, not send them a text, not drop them an email, but literally go and engage, look at the pictures and and go from there. And most of them say, no, I didn't do that. I encourage people, communicate, collaborate. You'll get your better results. You'll be happier. You know, we talked a little bit about solid things and fluid collections, but there's a series of topics to run through here on basically nipple disorders. And so since there's both a cosmetic and a functional aspect to this, and perhaps an emotional aspect to this, walk us through a little bit how you address the common nipple disorders, especially in the lactating person. Absolutely. I think what strikes me when I listen to Dr. Mitchell talk on this topic is why do we throw out of our heads the basic premises of caring for any other skin irritation or wound that we've all been taught as surgeons when it's a nipple that's been wounded by you know, trauma. Why do we think that this is somehow a completely different thing, like a completely different species of animal? It's not. It's human skin and it's been subjected to trauma. And that is why you know, she believes strongly and so do I that a surgeon has a very big role to play in this because we know how to take care of wounds. And so she points out that her clinical care points for taking care of nipples during lactation is essentially throw out everything that you think you know about this. Stop blaming thrush for everything. Thrush in immunocompetent infants is quite uncommon. And it is uncommon for the mother and child to pass this back and forth. Uh, Mm -hmm. So treating thrush and blaming it for everything um, is, I think, a real downfall in nipple care. Also, putting on these all-purpose nipple ointments that contain everything under the sun is a bad thing as well. What do we as surgeons know about open wounds that are well vascularized in immunocompetent individuals? They're just not that likely to be super infected or or, or cause deep infection or, or cause trouble. You wanna treat those with moist, closed wound healing principles, just like everything else. Don't put ointments and lotions and potions on them. You're more uh, often to cause uh, contact dermatitis um, than anything else. Also drying out the nipples with Epsom salt, antiseptics, alcohol, dear God, hair dryers. Would you treat any other wound on the, any other place in the human body that way? You wouldn't. Um, and so don't treat these that way. So just having a basic knowledge of wound care, which every general surgeon does, and not deciding to throw that all out the window and treating nipples. It's not usually fungal. It doesn't usually need a lot of lotions and potions. It doesn't need to be dried out. It needs to be protected with moist, closed wound healing principles, and it will get better, and you will do a great service to these patients. Under what conditions, if any, would you say that there should be changes to lactation or the desire to lactate or changes in the ability or continuance of breastfeeding. Are there any situations that come up where you tell somebody you've got to stop doing X or you've got to take a break from doing X or do those ever come up in your world? Sure. Patients that have malignancies, clearly uh, we need to honor their ability to breastfeed as long as is consistent with you know their beliefs, but still take care of the malignancy. So that's definitely one thing. The repetitive infections, it's just up to the patient. I have patients that will have two, three, four, five rounds of mastitis infected, galactoseals, things like that. And they're really committed to their plan to breastfeed their infant past 18 months. And you really try and and honor that. But I will say, and I'm going off script. I'm not sure if Dr. Mitchell would smack me or not for this, but this is what Dr. Captanian thinks. I think allowing patients to say enough is enough. There is definitely a stigma out there that if you don't breastfeed your child until they go to college, you didn't try hard enough, you're a failure. And truly, there is a lot built up in that. If you're not able to have a healthy, happy baby that you breastfeed blissfully, women can feel that they're a failure, which is absolutely not true. And so sometimes offering that woman permission to say, I've done my best, I'm going to take care of this baby, how I feed them does not define my worth is really important. 
a lot of times women will come to me and I'll say, have you thought about stopping breastfeeding? And they say, oh, thank goodness. They were literally waiting for someone to give them permission. So I don't know if that's just my experience, but I, 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 don't, I don't think it is. Women need to be given permission to do what they think is right for their bodies and their babies and um, not buy into a lot of the mommy blog hype out there. Well, I, I think you're right. And I think to your other comments, you know, in our business, it's easy if you're not careful to lose sight of what the person coming in is concerned about. As you mentioned, I had one staff guy when I was a resident who said, every time you meet a patient's family in the recovery room, tell them it wasn't cancer. Like even if you were fixing a hernia, because they all think they have cancer. I think that's a little extreme, to be honest with you. I mean, but people have these fears. And I think the thing is, when it comes to breastfeeding and parenting on anybody, but perhaps especially somebody on their first child, that they they usually absorb a lot of very strong advice that may or may not be strongly supported. And they need somebody to say, you know, there there are options in this world and they're not all bad. And I think giving somebody license to think that they could maybe do something different than the village would demand of them, um, not realizing that the entire village isn't the one writing these blogs. It's a small subset, but that's uh, good advice for people. And I, I hope they, they get it and I hope that we give it to them. I mean, you know, I know that there are people who are afraid of being canceled by saying something that doesn't meet somebody's idea of what's out there. You know, the truth doesn't lie halfway between right and wrong. I mean, you just got to tell people the truth and let them know what their options are. And I'll support patients in whatever they want. If they want permission to stop breast, we can take care of their baby in a very healthy way. If it is incredibly important to them to for prolonged breastfeeding, as long as, you know, you're in it with them, you really can get people to that prolonged point. Um, just persistence. It would be helpful if we could get the infant formula supply back on track. <laughs> that was awful. Yeah, that was awful. <laughs> yeah, it's better than it was, but it's still got some room to move. But that's a topic for another day on supply chain effects on global aspects of medicine. We'll take that up in another issue. That's one of my pet peeves. All right, so last chapter we wanted to get into, which gets a lot of attention compared to its frequency, but still needs a lot of attention because of its infrequency, is male breast disease. And, and again, I can't thank you enough for putting together an issue on the benign aspects of breast disease, even if most people think they're all cancers. It's still important to know them. But gynecomastia is a big topic with, a like, I think, a fair amount of public misconception and even misconception amongst some of our colleagues. So maybe you could just walk us through your general approach to somebody who comes in with a concern of excess male breast tissue one way or the next. You know, How do you handle it? I like to see these patients earlier rather than later. I would say that, again, they all think they have cancer, and some of them do. Mammogram is a very definitive test for gynecomastia versus Dr. Chatterjee and colleagues. I don't make as much of a deal with this, but I don't know why every male that comes to imaging comes with an order for ultrasound. I think that's because people don't know that you can have a mammogram. Uh, mammogram is still actually the best test for distinguishing a malignancy from gynecomastia. Gynecomastia has a very typical central flame-like appearance. And again, clinical exam highlighted here very well in this chapter that gynecomastia is central, it's rubbery, it's always just right underneath the nipple. Why is it sometimes unilateral, not bilateral? I don't know, but it is an often unilateral. Whereas cancers are going to be more solid, they can be slightly more peripheral and more distinct. So between physical exam and a mammogram, you should be able to rule out malignancy um, and go down a road of gynecomastia, which is 90% of the male breast disease I see. I would like to see these sooner rather than later. Everyone should. Because when gynecomastia is new and it's in the inflammatory stage, often you can try and figure out what caused that. Is it a hormonal alteration? Is it a medication? Um, almost 60% of gynecomastia is idiopathic, but you can treat it with discontinuing drugs or trying endocrine blockade. Once gynecomastia is set in for a, a year to 18 months, it enters a more fibrous phase. And now even if you can figure out what caused that gynecomastia, it's not usually in a stage where you can reverse it. This fibrous gynecomastia, therefore, more often require surgical intervention. So I would say that is a real pearl that you need to see this stuff 
earlier if you think you're going to have any effect with changing it while it's in its inflammatory phase. In the fibrotic stage, now you do have a surgical disease. Yeah, I'll say this is another disease that really struck me between my work in the civilian sector and my work in the military sector. And that when I was either on active duty or working in the DOD system as a civilian, gynecomastia was rampant. But a lot of the people we were taking care of have an unusual combination of supplements. Maybe you're taking things that are beyond supplements to improve you know, physical performance. And so they don't admit to as much as some of the other drugs that would probably get them kicked out of the army. But you know, usually we find that it's something that's ingested or injected in most of these young people. And as you say, if you catch them early and they stop that behavior, it's amazing how many have improved. Talk a little bit about what's your operative approach to how much to take out, how much to leave behind, how not to destroy the nipple, that kind of thing. So again, this chapter, I I picked it because you need to collaborate with plastic surgeons on this quite frequently. The grades of gynecomastia, the Simon classifications of gynecomastia, the Rorsch classifications of gynecomastia, these are very helpful. With these grade one gynecomastias that really kind of your softer gynecomastia, your less severe gynecomastia, I really find that collaboration with plastic surgeons for liposuction or vacuum assisted excision is very helpful. I haven't branched out into my own liposuction um, yet just because I have good plastic surgery colleagues that uh, we like to collaborate on these. Past that, I think keeping incisions away from the nipple in the inframammary fold can also be helpful. It just depends on the degree of gynecomastia and your degree of plastic surgery support. I don't find that the male chest wall skin is as plastic as, say, operating on a female breast or a juvenile breast. It has a tendency, once you remove the gland, the skin does not bounce back quite as well. So I do find that you do need more extensive skin rearrangements than some of the benign tumors that you take out of a female breast. But really collaborating with plastic surgeons and not doing too much for those grade one and grade two gynecomastias is quite helpful. And past that, using the most cosmetic appealing um, skin reduction incision. Aside from the classic central subarealar mass of gynecomastia, work us through a bit of the people who come in with masses, either cystic or solid, that are not characteristic of gynecomastia in males. And one thing we haven't mentioned at all is MR. And I would love to hear your thoughts on when, if at all, MR is useful in any of these situations. But how do we work through the more peripheral other lesions that show up in male breast tissue? Physical exam, pretty important. Um, Something that's going to disrupt the skin, uh, cause skin ulceration or skin fixation, I don't trust that. That's always going to be something that's bad. That's always going to be something that needs to come out. That's never going to be something that I'd like to observe. Skin lesions fixed to parenchymal lesions uh, truly are cause for concern. Past that, I mean, your more common peripheral lesions in in male breasts are going to be lipomas. And that's, again, where your physical exam really comes in. If you're just myopically focusing on the lump in the breast that you had the man referred to you as, and you don't ask him, oh, do you also have these on your neck and your back and your arms and your legs? Generally, uh, when I do see large lipomas in breasts, they have them other places as well. Lipomas can be well characterized by physical exam and ultrasound. And unless there's concern for liposarcoma, Um, or they're very bothersome to someone, they can be left in place. The authors of this chapter claim that breast cysts are uh, very rare in men. I don't know why I seem to get a lot of these, but I do. They can be treated exactly like cysts in female breasts. If they're simple, they can be left alone or aspirated. If they're complex, they probably should be biopsied or excised because complex cysts with things like, you know, your septations and internal debris, I have seen those be malignant as well. But otherwise, management is similar to breast cysts in women. And then the other thing that you can see in male breast is pseudoangiomatous stromal hyperplasia. And as in women, this is a benign lesion that's well characterized on ultrasound. And if you need a tissue diagnosis, ultrasound guided biopsy. But it's very reasonable to consider observation for all of these things. Another thing I see is breast infection. And honestly, they all have a fun story. They're all linked to some kind of trauma. They're the security officer whose gun belt goes right over the top of his nipple. It's the farmer whose overalls hit there. It's the fisherman who grabs something with a hook. True story. Seen that twice. They're underneath the car or underneath the crawl space. They're almost always involved in trauma. And so good history to figure out where were you when you sustained this wound. The gentleman is not going to tell you that he hooked his nipple with the fish hook. 
unless you actually take a great history. And that's going to definitely change what antibiotics you're going to use. So infections in men, almost always some inciting factor, and you need to be really cognizant of what that was to pick good antibiotics. Well, here in the great state of Maine, we see a lot of fish hook and fish related industry. Well, get, get ready for this one. Now you'll see this next week. But um, actually, the one that I had, the person intentionally used the fish hook for uh, a piercing. Yeah, they'd already been fishing with it, though, which was a bit of an issue. And that was erisipilifrix. So you get some you get some nice ones out there, mycobacteria marinum and things like that. But uh, you do have to be prepared for odd things. We saw a lot of it in the military folks with tactical gear. There's a lot of trauma. It's so similar to what we talked about with, you know, people moving around and athletes getting issues. I, I'll say that at least with us, with getting back to the lipomas for a bit, we tended to be pretty liberal with MR for lipomas that were bigger than five centimeters and or things where we thought there might be an intramuscular component because we might approach those a little differently. And one thing we haven't talked much about yet, and we don't have to get into it too far, but when we're talking about the kids, I mean, the relationship with anesthesia, some of these lesions to me, one of the, the real signs of nuance is whether people know what can you do in the office? What can you do in a well-equipped minor procedure room? And when should you be in a proper operating room to have good lights and good equipment and all the support you need? And a lot of it is, of course, patient-specific, but do you have any thoughts on how you choose your environment for diagnostics and why? Small lipomas, cyst aspirations, those things can be done, you know, minor local procedures. But gynecomastia, these are very vascular. They're always very vascular. They need to be done in an operating room where you, you at least have access to some suction and some electric cautery. And in an adolescent, I don't know, adolescent males, if you've been around them, how was your day? Fine. What did you learn at school? Nothing. They're not going to tell you anything, but there's still children. Um, they're scared just because they're not telling you things. So adolescents, I always take to the operating room. Um, I make sure that I've got an anesthesiologist that I think is versed in pediatric anesthesia. Those should always go to the OR, just my personal bias. But um, other than small lipomas and cysts, breasts are incredibly vascular organs. I always err on the side of having suction and cautery um, in a controlled operative setting as opposed to not being able to do that. Yeah, I've never regretted having had more resources than I needed. I have on occasion regretted having fewer resources than I need uh, in different environments. I just really thank you for the opportunity to present benign breast disease. I think your introduction um, to this uh, issue was spot on that these are not benign to the patient. Um, and so sometimes we get into the definite trap on all of these, a skin finding, a mass, something that's not normal. We see it and we say, aha, it isn't cancer. And the patient says, well, what is it? It's still bothersome to me and I still need it to be treated. You know, treating any of this, we have not presented anything in this issue that is not highly accessible to any well-trained general surgeon who understands incision placement, who understands history and physical, um, and who understands basics of wound care, but it's just the desire to do so. And so I hope that this was helpful. I really appreciate all the contributors, like I said, many of whom um, I look up to for advice on these topics. I think their contributions were good. Benign breast disease is not benign to the patient, and it is within the scope of every surgeon to help that patient back to better. Well, thanks again. And for all of our listeners, sometimes it just takes somebody explaining how to put the pieces of the puzzle together to make it a little clearer. And I think you did a great job. So we thank you very much for all your efforts with this. Thank you for joining us for the Surgical Clinics podcast devoted to management of benign breast disease. The four articles discussed, as well as nine others, are in the December 2022 issue, Volume 102, Number 6. This series is available for individual print or online subscriptions. Visit www.surgical.theclinics.com to subscribe. This series is also on the Elsevier Digital Platforms, Clinical Key, and Science Direct. Be sure to follow us on Twitter at Surgical Clinics, and you can subscribe to the podcast through Apple, Google Play, Spotify, Stitcher, and Amazon Music. Thanks for listening.